Good morning. Do you have your Bibles? Let me see them. Show them to me. Wave them at me. Throw them in the air like you just don't care. No, I'm just kidding. We don't do that. We do care about our Bibles. We care about our Bibles significantly. Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me quickly to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to continue our series about keeping the main thing the main thing. And, you know, as you'll find out, this is a five-week series. And being a five-week series, how, how many of you know that you can have multiple things, keeping them the main thing, right, right, Arvin? You know, so we're going to talk about different things this month. And, and uh, as, we, as we always endeavor to grow in our relationship with God, I hope you are. I hope that's a longing of your heart, that it's not just a byproduct. It's not just an afterthought. It's not just a, a Sunday morning, Wednesday night, maybe being a part of a, sun, a small group endeavor. Uh, I, I, I trust that you're trying to grow. You're trying to, to, to become more, you know. And so uh, I've got a passage of Scripture. I'll define it a little bit more for you in just a few moments. But the Bible tells us this. It says, Rejoice always and delight in your faith. Hallelujah. Rejoice always and delight in your faith. Sometimes what we, what we struggle with from time to time is, is our faith can, it, it, you know, I was talking to a couple this week, and one of the things that I realized is that, you know, when we were in the world, God didn't much care about it, or the devil didn't much care about us. You know what I mean? But then all of a sudden we come into Jesus, and guess what? It gets hard. Why? Because of the fact that there's a devil now. We, he didn't care. You were part of his kingdom before. But now, guess what? Guess what? Now you're part of God's kingdom, and he doesn't like that. His whole endeavor is not necessarily to, not necessarily to totally disrupt everything that's going on, although the Bible tells us in John 10.10 10, he, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We, un, we have to understand that if the devil can get you off mark with God, guess what? He's won. So the Bible tells me to rejoice always. There's something inside of a believer, Paul is saying. There is something happening on the inside of a Christian. There's hap something happening inside of us that we should always have the capacity to rejoice. But how many of you know that's not always true? Because guess what? We don't always rejoice. As a matter of fact, in the older version of the New Living, it says, always be joyful. It's a command. It's not even a suggestion. Rejoice always and delight in your faith, verse 17. Be unceasing and persistent in prayer. You know what that tells me? That tells me that I have a constant relationship with God. It says that I know within whom all of my health, all of my wealth, all of my consist, all of, everything I have need of because you know what? It doesn't say talk to your neighbor, talk to your friend, talk to your mama, talk to your daddy, talk to your kids. It's, what does it say? Be unceasing and persistent in prayer. That means I know by whom my hope comes from. That's where my conversation is. It's amazing how often we'll talk to folks. When actually God's just simply saying, here, talk to me. Verse 18. It says, in every situation, no matter what the circumstances, say no matter what the circumstances. What's the next two words? Be thankful. Hmm. That's not fun, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. But in all of the circumstances of life, in all of the challenges and trials that we endeavor to go through, on all of the issues that we seem to need victory in, in every situation, we're going to talk about a situation, a couple of situations, over the next few minutes this morning. One of the situations was pretty dire. One of the situations was... Pretty much the death sentence had been set. Actually, there's two of them that I'm going to use as illustrations this morning. But in those situations, in the midst of them, in the midst of that circumstance, in the midst of what they were going through, guess what? They had that thankful gratitude. It goes on to tell us, it says here, and continually give thanks to God. So be thankful is an atmosphere, an attitude that we have. It's a, but, but who gets that thanks? God. One of, one of the things that I've learned about myself is I'm, a, I'm not all that. 
But he is all that, all the time, and never fails. It goes on to tell me, it says, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, over the next few moments, I just ask, Lord, that you would allow my, allow my tongue, Heavenly Father, like the Bible says, to be that of a ready writer. I pray, Heavenly Father, that, that, that the oracles that I speak are not mine but yours. I ask, Heavenly Father, that you would challenge our hearts. God, the, the goal is not feel good always. The goal is change. The goal is transformation. The goal is the production and the, produ and the producing of hope. And so, God, I pray right now in the few short moments that we have, God, you would do all those things. Holy Spirit, begin to move on the hearts and the minds of the people so that they can receive in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you guys a question this week. Did you ask yourself, have you asked yourself, is my relationship with God where it could be? That was last week's sermon. We, we, we started with that as the element in the, in the message. Is, is your relationship, if you're absolutely honest with yourself, is it everywhere that it could be? Now, you might have some areas that are really sound. Maybe you got your Bible study down and it's, you're, you've got that working out, but your prayer time's not so smart. How, how about this? Maybe, maybe, you've got, maybe you've got the ability to love people, but you're not even reading the Word. Maybe, where, where is your life right now? If you were to do an honest evaluation, one of the things that I feel as we come to the end of the year, my evaluation is, am I closer to God in November than I was in, in January of this year? Have I grown? What has God taught me? What has God revealed to me? So if, if I understand that my relationship with God should be continually and perpetually growing, there's always something, there's always something that, that prevents me from developing. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I don't know what that thing is. It, there, there's always something that's develop, preventing me from developing in a deeper walk with God. There's always something that is keeping me from growing in my spiritual hunger. There's, there's always something that's creating a desire or absent, absent, that desire to be absent from creating within me a simple desire to be a better follower of Jesus. And you know what they are? They're just distractions. We gave you a definition last week of, uh, of distractions that, that, there, that there's something just simple, something simply that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. What right now is distracting you or preventing you from full attention to your walk in relationship with God? Oh, Pastor Bob, you know what? It could be a bunch of stuff. You know, this week, just to give you an idea of some of the stuff that we're, that we're, we're endeavoring to, to, to look at, we know that Jesus should always be our main thing. But how many of you know this week, I already talked to some folks, and they've already started preparing for Thanksgiving. Now, I didn't know that you had to make cornbread early so that you could make a dressing, you guys in the south call it dressing down here. Up north, we called it stuffing. Down here, you call it it's down here you call it dressing. And they're not the same thing. Let me just tell you. Can I get an amen? They're not the same thing. If Jesus is always to be my main thing, I understand that shopping and cooking and cleaning and the priorities of, like, footballing. You know, some of you guys already got your, your day planned for Thanksgiving because you got that football or those football teams. And you're just, you, you've got it all ready to go. How about this? How about the distraction of putting on the right face? Some of y'all are going to see family that you would rather not see. Keep laughing, looking forward, because it's the truth. Some of us come into the holidays, and this is, they say that this is the greatest level of anxiety that people encounter all year long. It's, 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 as we step into these holidays, there are many things. Let me, let, me, let me share this thought with you. There are many things that can cause us to lose sight of the main thing. I think I have a bullet for you on that. But how many, how many, many things? What are the many things? What are the distractions that cause us to lose sight of the main thing? And as we, as we talk about these things, I, I thought about last week's sermon. As, as I was writing this, I thought, what about Mary and Martha? The just That I think, I don't know if I'm losing my microphone or not. All right, we're good. I got it. I got it back. I got it back. We're good. 
Sometimes we get a distract. Just so y'all know, when you hear pops and snaps and crackles sometimes, most of the time it's not our team. Most of the time, we're so close to this firehouse right here that sometimes we get a pop in that, that, that it just gets a distraction. So I just want to make sure that, hey, just chill out. Nobody's fired. Everybody's good. All right. But what are the many things? Did you know that hurts can be a distraction? Did you know that offenses can be a distraction? Did you know that activities can be a distraction? I'm so busy. I, I'm so busy. I'm so busy. But Mary had the right thing. Jesus looked at Martha and said, Martha, you're, you're so busy with so many things. But Mary's found the main thing. She's found the one thing. And so, so we can have activities. How about business or just simply busyness? B-U-S-Y-N-E-S-S. There are so many things. We can, can I say family can be a distraction? Yes, I said there. I went there. Did you know that your family can be a distraction to the things that God has for you? And so this morning, as we, as we start to endeavor to talk about this, we, we can't fix everything all at once. You know, that part of, the, part of the reason we do series at Lighthouse Church, and I've shared this with you before, is this reason. It's so that we, we set before you 12 thoughts or ideas. Because I know that 52 different messages on Sunday mornings, you're not going to, you'll get overwhelmed if you try to do all of them. But if you'll focus on the 12, you might be able to accomplish three or four. I always tell people when they go to conferences or they go to training seminars, get one thing and learn that one thing and endeavor to embark upon that one thing because if you'll apply that one thing, the next time you get to go, guess what? You'll have some other things that you can learn from. So, so this whole month, we're talking about keeping the main thing the main thing. And I want to set before you not necessarily the content of the message, but the thought in your mind, am I keeping the main thing the main thing? Are there distractions in my life? Are there things that God is trying to get through to me or speak to me that I'm not paying attention to? See, one of the things that I've learned is that when I'm trying to keep the main thing the main thing, today's message is really about this. I must become intentional about having a gratitude attitude. When we talk about this subject, you know, it's Thanksgiving, and it's, you know, it's interesting to me. You know, what it, I didn't want to go to Thanksgiving. I, I really didn't. You know, I'm thinking to myself, okay, every year, they, you know, Easter, you have the Easter sermon. Christmas, you have the Christmas sermon. Mother's Day, you have a Mother's Day sermon. You know, Thanksgiving, you got to have a Thanksgiving sermon. But we should, have a, we should have a lifestyle of gratefulness. We should have a lifestyle of gratitude, but the hard part is, is that life happens and distractions come. And, and, and guess what? Not every day is stellar. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? Not every day is awesome, but I must maintain, I must become intentional. Because it's not natural, because it's not my natural DNA, because it's not something that we naturally are, we have to be intentional about it. Means, what does that mean? I've got to make it a main thing in my life. I've got to think gratefulness. I've got to think. Now, now. You can develop yourself to a place where you're always grateful. You can develop yourself to a place that you have an attitude of gratitude. You can develop yourself to a place where, where you're grateful with, with, uh, with regularity, but it's not natural. You have to program yourself. Romans tells us that we have to transform our minds. There's a, there's a process that takes place. So am I, as I'm thinking about, you know, can you imagine with me if we were to close our eyes for just a moment and, and we just, can you imagine with me waking up every morning with a heart full of gratitude? The first thing, oh, you know, I was thinking about as I wrote this message and I've got a little mark in my notes that I thought about it because I, my, the way that I pray in the mornings is sometimes different than the way I pray at night. Because I remembered the way my grandfather prayed. My grandfather had this little desk, and he, it was a little small desk, and it was right near the, the entry of his, of his, of his uh, bedroom. And that, that was his Bible desk. That's where it, he would sit with his Bible. He would do his study before he even came out of the bedroom. But I remember hearing him pray. And he, he would, it would go something like this, and I've, 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 I've added it to my life. Lord, thank you for another day 
you've given me to serve you. That's how he started. Isn't that true, Emma? Isn't that, that, that's something that she hears me pray with regularity. God, thank you for another day you've given me to serve you. That didn't come from anything that I knew in my spirit. That didn't come from something that was just, ooh, I got that in a service. It came from looking at a life that by the time he hit the end of his road, he was 97 years old. But this man, over the course of his life, learned how to start every day. God, I thank you for another day you've given me to serve you. He built within himself this attitude of gratitude. Can you imagine where every breath taken is a celebration of life's blessing? Can you imagine waking up that, that, that with focus that we have, we, we, it's not on what we don't have, it's what we do have. We wake up and we simply, before the feet even hit the ground, God, I thank you I've not sinned yet today. Because how many of you know it's coming? But, but, but we, we, we wake up with this, this, this zest and this zeal for life with it not, oh, gosh, I got that meeting. I mean, I, I, I've done this before. I've woken up. Oh, it's Thursday. Okay. There, I love morning prayer meeting. I love Thursday morning 6 a.m. prayer meeting. I love it. But you know what? I got to be honest with you. When that buzzer goes off at 4 a.m., there are days Oh, please, Lord, let Pastor Barry not miss. Please, let's let him do it for me today. You know, but then you know what? How many of you know that's not grateful? It's not, God, I'm excited to see what you have today for me. I'm so excited about it. Can you imagine waking up every single day? You know what? Your life might be broke as a joke, but guess what? He is the one that every need, he supplies every need according to your riches and glory. And you know what? Your body or your mind might be dysfunctional, but I have. Uh, but, but we wake up and we say, God, I thank you that I've got the mind of Christ today. We wake up in the morning, not with our bodies broken, but, but, but we wake up, oh, God, thank you I'm healed today. I had to do that today. My body is sore. I hung, I hung some shelves in my, in my garage the, yesterday, and my body's a little sore. And I thought, you know, how, how quickly do I think about God over ibuprofen or ibuprofen over God? But you know what? When I wake up, I'm like, God, you've given me another day to serve you. You've given me another opportunity to meet you, to have conversation with you, to see your goodness, to see your glory in my life. See, if I understand this, I, if practicing gratitude with regularity, it only enhances my well-being because he's the author and the finisher of my faith. It transforms my entire outlook on life. It, it allows me to have an attitude that is in line with his word. See, when I recognize this, and I know that in a world that often races past appreciation, a world that often doesn't even visit thankfulness, it, it's, a, it's a life that is viewed as empty. But you know what? I understand this. A simple shift will reduce stress in my life. They say that statistically 25%, just having a right attitude about thankful, thankfulness and gratitude will reduce stress in your life by 25%. Did you know that it'll increase happiness by 25%? I'm sorry, reduce stress by 28%. It'll increase happiness by 25%. It improves your mood. It helps you with sleep. It helps you with your immunity. It decreases depression. Guess what else it does? It helps you relieve anxiety. It, it, it reduces chronic fatigue and chronic pain and illness in your body. It did you know that grateful people are more generous people? Grateful people are generous people. They're, 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 they're more free with their stuff than, than other people. Did you know that grateful people are more kind? And they're, and they're even more helpful. So, so if you're looking at your family and you're going, okay, that one's not kind, that one's not just, you know what, just check and see if they're thankful. How often, how often do we stop and think about this subject matter of gratitude and having this attitude that lines up with God's word? See, a gratitude attitude, when we understand these things, what, what happens is, is we find ourselves in the midst without it, in strained relationships. We, we, we find ourselves oftentimes in isolation. Have you ever met that negative Nellie? 
Nobody's named Nellie here, is there? But you make that negative Nellie. They walk in a room and you go, you, you hope they don't even see you. Why? Because in their presence, you just kind of feel like all of a sudden it jumped on you. You're like, I don't, I don't like that. Because why? We're, we're, we, we, we see that these folks, they don't have a grateful attitude. They're n they don't have a gratitude attitude. So today I want to talk to you just for a few moments about this subject of gratitude. We must acquire a gratitude attitude that is not determined by our situation, but by our relationship in Jesus. You and I, we will oftentimes find ourselves in, in, in various precarious situations. But is he really greater in you than what's going on in the world? See, we all can find ourselves in various situations. Maybe something came to you on your job. Maybe there's something that didn't happen as you planned it to go. Maybe something happened is happening slower than you think it should. And you're looking at that situation. But because your relationship with Jesus, you're still like my grandpa Eugene. Father, thank you for another day you've given me to serve you. Thank you for another opportunity to live in the way that you want me to live. You know what? I've learned it's easy when everything is going well. But when things aren't going so well, and, and you know, like for example, you know, when, when, when the money is abundant, you know what? The kids are listening. Uh, uh, the, the refrigerator is full. The car is, is running like a top. But guess what? The, the water heater goes out. Oh, me. Guess what? The kids need a new pair of shoes, but I just bought you a new pair of shoes two weeks ago. I know. I outgrew them. You know, but, but that becomes a situational joy rather than because of my relationship in Jesus. I can go, thank you, God, that you've given me the resources. What do we do when the resources are light? What do we do when they're non-existent? What do we do when they're absent? What do we do when our kids push us to the absolute limit of our parenting capacity without murder in place? Do we maintain the gratitude? God, thank you for that boy. Thank you for that girl. Your spouse and you are not getting along. You got to figure out why. But are, how many of you know you're just grateful that you got one? God, thank you for my wife. Thank you that she's a gift to me. Thank you, God, that she, you know, my wife is phenomenal. It was funny, we were talking, Emma and I were talking last night at dinner, and she looked at me. Mom was up. She was just kind of doing all the, she was just, she was serving everybody. And she, and, and, and Emma looked at me, and she goes, She's becoming like Grandma Vernon. I said, she's identical to Grandma Vernon. But I'm like, Dana, you don't have to do that. No, I want to do that. It, it, this gratefulness, but when it's absent, guess what? We begin to question God. Where are you? Why isn't it working the way that I expect it to? Gratitude doesn't flow easy when things are in trouble. We're not grateful for the situation. We're not grateful for the circumstance. But Scripture provides us clear examples that are really a superpower. That, 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 that this, this gratitude is really a superpower found within a gratitude attitude. It, it, it's amazing. And, and, and I thought to myself, here we are getting ready to talk about superpowers. And I thought, you know what? Most of us, any, any DC fans? Or, or, or how, you're more of a Marvel fan. You know, I don't know. Marvel versus DC. I get there. That's always the, that's the comic book wars right there. DC is, is, your, is your Superman and Batman. And, and, and Marvel is your Captain America and Hulk and those guys. All right? So now you know what I'm talking about. DC fans? Any DC fans? Superman? Batman? Okay, how, how about Marvel fans? Let me see. Come on. I need some I'm in ministry participation here for just a minute. Okay, but, but when we think about superpowers, something, we only, we only think about Superman or Batman or the Incredible Hulk or, or even Spider-Man. But when we talk about this superpower found within gratitude, the gratitude of attitude, what often we find is most of the time we think of superpowers as something supernatural happened. It doesn't have to be supernatural. It's a decision. 
See, you have to remember Batman was a decision to become a superhero. He didn't get bit by a spider, and he didn't have a gamma ray bust him. He didn't come from a foreign planet like Krypton, right? Those guys had superpowers that were, that were imposed upon them from some supernatural source. Batman became a superhero. Why? Because he made a decision to be a superhero. We have the ability to make the same decision, to allow the superpower of gratefulness to manifest in our lives. See, an attitude of gratitude is something that each one of us can develop and become, it can become a main thing in our lives. Let me give you this bullet point. Gratitude has such a superpower, is, has such a superpower that it can literally alter the atmosphere and the environment and you are. It can actually change the environment in which you are in. If you jumped in, and we'll talk about a couple of illustrations here in just a minute, but we, we've shared how important the Word of God is in our lives and how it assists us in building our faith. And as I build my faith, we, we come to this place of reality that, that God's Word becomes more active and more reliable, more actionable than anything else in our lives. That passage in 1 Thessalonians, it says, Be thankful in every circumstance and thank God. So there's something that's both a God side and a man side to this equation. See, there's two critical things that I firmly believe that as a church and as believers and as in my personal life, that the Word of God and the Spirit of God are the things that help you overcome. You can't, you can't have one without the other. Do you realize this, that if you just have the Word of God, many of you will become legalistic. But if you just have the Spirit of God, guess what? You'll become a flake. Did you know that the Word of God grounds you? And the Spirit of God lifts you? If you understand that, then, then we begin to, we come to this place where we learn what the Word says and we begin to do what the Word says. In fact, in several scriptures here, I'll give them to you real quick before I give you four simple points and we'll get out of here. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything. Well, right there. How many of you got something you got to worry about? Let's tell you, don't, not, don't do it. Don't worry about it. God's got it. If you really believe it, God's got it. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and what are we supposed to do? Thank him for all he's done. Thank him for all he's done. This is a, this is a, this is a precursor. When I, when I was looking at these verses, I thought to myself, do you realize that when I have a grateful attitude, when I have a gratitude attitude, guess what? I don't worry. I just simply thank him. I don't worry about anything. I let the peace of God that passes understanding rule and reign in my life. Because guess what? I know that he's got it. If I'm supposed to not worry about anything, I have to believe that there's a reason why I don't have to worry. And usually it settles somewhere in the word because there's a promise, there's a blessing, there's a provision available for us. How about this, Colossians chapter 3, verse 15? It says, and let the peace of God, the peace that comes from Christ, rule in your hearts. For, the, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Do you realize that a, a gratitude attitude releases peace in your life? Just because the spouse is not happy with you doesn't mean you have to lose your joy. It doesn't mean that you have to lose your peace. Just because something went down at work that shouldn't have gone down like that at work, guess what? I don't have to lose my peace over the situation. Just because the water heater goes out, the car breaks down. I don't have to stress about things like that. Because guess what? The Bible tells me that if I'm thankful, if I'm always thankful, I can let God's peace rule in my life. But oftentimes we don't do that. So if I understand that, look at what another passage says that Paul wrote. He says, and give thanks for everything. To God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give thanks for everything. Now, Pastor Bob, I don't want to, get, I don't want to be thankful for that boss that I don't like. Be thankful for him. Be thankful for them. You know what? 
There might be things that are going on right now that if you changed your attitude about what was going on and you put on a gratitude attitude, it might change the situation without even you even opening your mouth, without even saying a word. You can have a gratitude attitude. Your attitude can change and alter the scenario and the situation. My daughter was telling me about a situation the other day at work, and she works for a large company here in our city. And, and she was like, Dad, I, I can't get all this stuff done. I can't. I'm in charge of this event. 300 people are coming to it, but I've got pieces. How many of you have ever, how many of you did not like those projects where there was four or five people assigned parts of the project, and you, were, you, were, you, you knew your part, but the other four people didn't do their part? And you're stressing now because they're not doing your part. I've got to do my part now. And I told her, I said, sweetie, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Send out an email to everybody just with a status update. Say, hey, this is where I've got. How many of you guys are, or what, what, these are the things I need yet. And, and, and you know what? She got an email back within 10 minutes of that email going out. She'd never thought about just doing a status update, a very simple status update email just to get where everybody was. She got a text message or an email back within 10 minutes that says, from her boss, says, you rock. How many of you know that's where peace lives? See, when I'm thankful for everything, you know what? I don't have to worry about anything. When I'm, did you hear what I said? That might be the message of the whole thing. When I'm thankful for everything, I don't have to worry about anything. How about Psalms? We'll get through these couple and we'll be done. Psalms 107, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Maybe we just learn how to, maybe you just learn how to trust in who he is. Maybe we just need to learn and understand that he's the faithful one. He's the one that's the supplier of every good morning, Lord. Thank you for another day that you've given me to serve you. God, you're a good God. You're the giver of good gifts, and every good and perfect thing comes down from you, the Father of lights. Within you, God, there is no variableness nor slightest suggestion of change. God, if you did it yesterday, you'll do it today. If you'll do it today, you'll do it for me tomorrow. Guess what? Now my attitude begins to shift just a little bit. Last but not least, how about Psalms 95? It says, let us come to him with thanksgiving. It's interesting, and I, I was going to do a little bit sidebar study on this, but I, I knew I wasn't going to have time because I had far too many pages in my notes anyway. Um, it's a problem that Bob has. Okay, um, if I could get my notes down to two pages, I think I'd be really good. But I've got seven, and that's it. that seems to be my average right now, and I've got to get it down to two. And uh, Any other preachers in the room know what I'm talking about? Anyway, okay, so, so here I am. The Bible says in Psalms, it says that we are to let us come to him with thanksgiving. Do you know what the Bible talks about it in all the different illustrations that we can go into? The very first attitude that we come to God is we come to him with thanksgiving. Before we ask for forgiveness, before we ask for re redemption, before we ask, but the Bible says when, when they came into the temple, they came in with the offerings and the sacrifices of thanksgiving. There's something about coming to God. How many of you parents in the room understand what I'm talking about when you look at your kids and they go, Dad, I like this, or they come to you first and they go, Dad, I really love you. Thank you for being my dad. Thank you so much for blessing me with my room and my clothes. Thank you so much for doing Can I have this, Dad? You're like a whole lot more apt to say yes when you have grateful kids. One time I told my daughter Lauren this. I said, I said, Lauren, you're spoiled. She goes, but I'm grateful. <laughs> Literally, she, that quick, as fast as it came out, she popped off with me. But I'm grateful. You know, I, I understand these things. When I look at these scriptures, when we get our gratitude attitude right, things begin to change. Things begin to change in our lives. And, and I, I firmly believe that as we go through just a few elements, and, and, and guys, I could have, we could have preached the whole series, the whole sermon, the whole month on gratefulness and gratitude and all of those kinds of things. Because at the end of the day, we, we say this every year, gratitude, thankfulness, gratefulness ought not be preached but one time a year, but that just seems to be somewhat of a, of a redundancy because we got to remember the holiday. I was thinking about this, how we long for the supernatural to take place in our lives. We really do. We long for it. And with this longing for the supernatural, as I studied this week, I, I came to this conclusion that before God can do anything, something has to happen in me. 
Before God can do anything, and I'm not saying that God's not capable. I'm saying that the way that he writes his word and the way his word is written and the way his word is revealed to us, before he does something, there is an expectation on me. See, God's not moved by your complaining. You knew I had to go there, didn't you? God's not moved by your complaints. He's not moved by my complaints. And, and because, of, because of our complaining, whether you go to Numbers chapter 11 and the Bible talks about the complaining that was going on with the children of Israel as they were leaving Egypt, the Bible talks about the murmurings and all the, the complaining and, 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 and go, go, go a couple chapters further and you can look at Numbers chapter 16 and Korah, which is one of the leaders of the folks and, 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 and as the children of Israel have left and uh, their, their bitterness and their complaining, 20 some thousand people, the, the earth opened up and swallowed them. Uh, just gone because you know it's amazing to me how often we allow complaining to be the precursor of our lives my life's not perfect my life's not this my life's not that i'm not getting this they're not doing that and guess what happens is as we establish whether we talk about complaining as a subject matter all by itself if i get to this place of complaint before the attitude of gratitude or the gratitude attitude that i desire nothing's going to change in my life i've got to come to the place that complaints are not my priority Talk about a complaint department. God doesn't have one of those. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's not, he's not interested in hearing what's going wrong in your life. He's interested in hearing what's going on right in your life. And in the middle of telling him what's going right in your life, guess what? You can say, but God, this is something that I, I don't understand. I, don't, I can't figure out why it's not happening. He's like a whole lot more apt to respond to us. So I want to share four simple keys to cultivating a gratitude attitude. Just very, just simple, four. And I'm going to tell some stories. So this is going to be your requirement to go back and read the stories because I don't have the time to tell you all the stories. But these four simple keys to, to cultivating a gratitude attitude. Number one, we must always choose to remain grateful despite the risk. Despite the risk. In spite of the risk. You know what? I can be grateful and nothing change. Risk it. Put it up there. The Bible tells us in the book of Daniel, if you go to Daniel chapter 6, we're going to read this message, uh, passage in just a minute. Daniel is a young man who had been born into noble, nobility, and out of this nobility, he gets the people of Israel. They get, they get put into capture. He goes through these two kingdoms. He gets raised up. God has supernaturally used this young man and others to, 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 to minister. And, and I think it was King Darius, if I remember correctly. King Darius made the statement. He, he, he said, I'm going to turn this all of Babylonia, all of the provinces. He said, I'm going I'm to create regions. And he said, I'm going to put princes over all of them. And Daniel gets raised up to be like one of three individuals that are in command. He did such a good job that at that level, the king was thinking about giving him authority over everything. How many of you know that's a pretty good job to have? So he's got this authority, but because of the fact that the fellas that really weren't happy with him, they didn't like him, they go to the king and they say, hey, would you do me a favor? We want to make sure we honor you. How many of you know sometimes that manipulation happens? And in that manipulation, they're saying, hey, you know what? How about for the next 30 days, nobody can worship anybody but you? Oh, that's okay. I don't mind that. Not thinking that some of the people that aren't worshiping him are still people that he favors and loves. So they passed this law, and that law is so important. It's so, incredi it's so critical. He can't even change it himself. And now fast forward. If somebody doesn't pray to you, They'll be thrown into the lion's den. How many of you remember the story? The problem is, is that most of us, we will manage the risk to determine whether or not we're grateful or not. We'll manage whether or not we should continue being grateful. Look at what happens in Daniel chapter 6, verse number 10. It says, but when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home, knelt down, 
As usual in the upstairs room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, doing what? Giving thanks to God. God, Can you just imagine how that prayer might have gone? God, you know what? They just passed a law. How many of you know that our government's going to pass some laws? Can I look at me? Our government is going to pass some laws. And those laws will directly affect you and me at some point. But will you have the same resolve of gratefulness, knowing where all things come from? Are you going to maintain in the midst of risk whether or not you continue to be grateful? He was grateful. He had an attitude. He's, I've done this for three, I've done this though my whole life for three times a day. I'm gonna, just going to continue to honor you, God. So we have to learn how to, we have to learn that to be grateful and remain grateful despite the risk. Number two, Bert, can you come? Bert, can you come? We should never allow where we are to become a deterrent to gratitude. Say, where am I? You know, so, so we, we should never allow where we currently are to become a deterrent to gratitude. So often our surroundings become the determining factor as to whether we give thanks or not. It's going our way. We're getting what we want. It's, it's happening as we think it should. Sometimes we find ourselves in a place, uh, uh, ourselves that, that, that we, that we, someplace that we, that we don't want to be. But I, but I find something so interesting. You can, whether we talk about Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, the Bible says they sang praises, just in case you didn't know what it said in Acts chapter 16. The Bible says they sang praises. It, it, they, they never allowed the, where they are, well, bless God, I'm in this job, and it's, it's a dead-end job. They never allowed where they are. I'm in this marriage, and it's just, they never allow where they are. I don't know what my kids are going to do. When they, uh, it's not a matter of where they are to become a deterrent to their gratitude. If you go with me to the book of Jonah, I don't have time to go through all of it, but I want you to go to the book of I want you to go to the book of Jonah. Just in case you don't know where that is, that's before Micah. And that's right after Obadiah. But there's this passage in the middle of the book. And if you know the story, the story says Jonah is told, he said, I, I are told by God, I want you to go to Nineveh, I want you to preach a revival, and the whole city's gonna get saved. And he says, Heck no, peace, I'm out. Went the other direction. Right? And because he went the other direction, what do we know about the story? Storm arose. Because the storm arose, he said, guys, you know what? There's no other way we're going to get out of this. Toss me overboard. I don't know that I would have volunteered for that. But, but to be honest with you, when you read it, it's kind of fun. So, so he gets tossed overboard. And guess, we all know the story, right? He gets swallowed by a well. But in chapter 2, it's very interesting. It begins in verse 17. The Bible says, in verse 17 of chapter 1, it says this, Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Guess what? In the middle of the belly of the whale, chapter 2 takes place. The Bible tells me this, But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Guys, in the belly of the whale, he never lost his gratitude. He never lost. In the belly of bad situation, in the belly of, 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 of terrible situations, in the belly of badness, God still is there, and he can hear you. The Bible tells me. And Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord about my trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the world of the dead. The Lord, you heard me. You threw me into the ocean's depths and sank to the heart of the sea. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then, then I said, Lord, you have driven me from your presence. How will I ever again see your holy temple? I sank beneath the waves, and death was very near. The waters closed in around me, and the seaweed wrapped itself around my head. 
it. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was locked out of life and imprisoned in the land of the dead. But you, O oh Lord my God, have snatched me from the the yawning death, the lo- the, the the yawning depths of lo- of de- uh, jaws of death. Stop with me for just a minute. That is a bad place to be. But you know what? He was grateful because the very next verses tell us that in that place, gratefulness came. The attitude of gratitude was manifested. It's amazing to me that Jonah could have quit or given up. If, what if he hadn't been grateful in the belly of the whale? Would we have ever heard the story? Would we have ever considered the story? Number three, and I've only got two more and we're out of here. Number three, when we maintain a right gratitude attitude, it opens a door to become an example and an encouragement for others. Did you know that? See, when I'm, when I'm grateful, when I'm grateful, I'm going to give you another fishing story. I'm going to give you another water story. But turn with me, if you will, to Mark chapter 27. Mark cha- or, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 27. The story reads as a modern-day action story. And if you read all of chapter 27, go into chapter 28, start in 26, we find that Paul gets imprisoned. And he's going to Rome. It's not a good time to sail. And the storm picks up. And for 14 days, these guys have been at sea. And and there's no hope of tomorrow. They've been tossing stuff left and right overboard. 276 people, I think, are on board. They start to toss. I mean, this was such a bad thing that they actually laid, the Bible says they laid rope underneath the boat to tie the boat together so that the boat wouldn't come apart. And I understand and know that when, when we maintain a right gratitude attitude, it opens the door for encouragement to other people. Here we are in the middle of what's going on, just very similarly to what's going on with Jonah. And guess what we find out? Paul says, hey, stop, stop. Let's take a break right here in the middle of what's going on. And in verse number 27, chapter 27, verse 33, it says, as the darkness gave way to the early morning light, Paul begged everyone to eat. You haven't touched food for two weeks, he said. Please eat something now for your own good, for not a hair on your head will perish. Then he took some bread, and look at what he did. He didn't just eat. He didn't just eat. The Bible says he gave thanks. Can you imagine for 14 days being in a storm where nobody's, I just, I, I mean, I get, I, get, I, get green, I get green in the gills on just a little bit of a wave. I can't imagine where I'm trying to save my life. I do. I get seasick really bad. Like, mm. Anybody ever been there? Can you imagine? They probably weren't holding anything back. They were letting it rip. But the Bible says here, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God before them all, and they broke off a piece and they ate it. Look at what the next verse says. Then everyone was encouraged. Can you imagine having a gratitude attitude? Just give me a piece of bread. If you're telling me to eat, just give me a piece of bread. But you know what? In the middle of the storm, the storm is still raging. Stuff is still happening. He was an encouragement to others. And the Bible tells us at the end of this passage, at the end of this section of of reading, it actually says that all of the individuals, all 270-odd, some of them, survived. If Paul can give thanks, not after the storm had passed, but right in the middle, we can also give thanks in the middle of our storm as well. We have that ability. We have that capacity. Last one in this. Would you stand to your feet? Last one. We need to pursue a heart of thanks before the evidence, before there is evidence of enough. Before we have enough, before we know, we know what the need is, But this final illustration and story that I want to give you comes out of the book of Matthew, chapter 14. So often believers have a heart of thanks where everything is right. 
And everything is more than enough. There's enough in the bank. The cupboards are full. Our desires are met. But what happens when there is an obvious need and there doesn't appear enough to meet it? The Bible tells me in 1 Kings 17, what happens when you're fixing your final meal for you and your son and you're just preparing to die? What happens in 1 Samuel chapter 2 when you've been barren your whole life and God gives you a child, but you don't see the baby before it? What do you do in, in 1 Samuel? You're barren, but you don't see the baby. Genesis 22. Or you've been given a child, but God asks you for him back. Or how about in Luke 17 where, where there's 10 lepers and God says, go show yourself. What do you do? It's hard when we don't see the answer immediately. That's faith, church. That's the subject matter of faith. That's another message all in and of its own. But that's faith. Because I understand and know that we need to pursue the heart of thanks before there is evidence of enough. Matthew chapter 14. 5,000, the feeding of the 5,000. It says, send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. But, Lord, we don't have enough. But, God, I don't have enough. I don't have enough to pay that house mortgage. I don't have enough. I, I don't have enough. I don't know what your not enough is. But in the middle of this moment, he says, bring them to me. And he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking five loaves and two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks. He gave thanks. He gave thanks. He gave thanks. Say, so he gave thanks. He gave thanks. And he broke it. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. And the Bible says the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Sometimes you don't see the enough, but are you still thankful when there's not enough by what you see? What do you do? The biblical odds are in your favor that if you have a thankful heart, God can do something. If you have a right spirit, see, I understand and know this. We could talk about David for protection, Solomon for provision, Mary for being asked to become the mother of Jesus, Job experiencing great loss and suffering, Moses for crossing the Red Sea. But this is what I know. We must learn that, that, that gratitude is a superpower that releases God's provision, it releases his protection, and it releases his power into our lives. The superpower of gratitude develops more and more as we grow in our relationship with God. And as I close, where we keep the main thing the main thing, we will reflect the superpower of a gratitude attitude. With every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around. We're transitioning this week. We're going into, going into the holidays, and I understand this. Many of us are having family. We're having the kickoff to Christmas and all of those kinds of things, and it's a daunting endeavor. I know this. All the emotions, histories, and concerns, and even complaints. But like at the beginning of this morning's sermons, imagine with me a complaint-free holiday. Imagine with me that every meal is cooked to perfection. Imagine with me that every gift is exactly right. Imagine with me that your team wins. Imagine with me that nobody interrupts your turkey coma nap. Because where we keep the main thing the main thing, we will reflect the superpower of a gratitude attitude. You're here this morning and you need to repent like Jonah for not maintaining a right attitude. Maybe you've allowed complaining to become the norm. Maybe without even knowing it, you've lost hope. And your response has become, what's the use anyway? God wants to bring wholeness and healing to your life. As I was ministering, and something in you stirred, 
about having a gratitude attitude or not having a gratitude attitude, let me put it this way. You're in this place and you just say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Would you raise your hand? I just want to pray for you. There's folks in the room that, that they just, they're just being honest with God, saying, God, I'm not, I haven't been grateful. Father, right now, with every hand that's up in this room, you see them. And you see the, the specifics of that gratitude, attitude, absence in their life. Father, I pray right now, Lord, that, that you would challenge them to walk in the superpower of gratitude. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we come together as a body of believers, we just simply, there's no, there's no stones to throw. There's no a- actions or attitudes that we need to have. We just need to simply say, God, forgive me. Say it with me, church. God, forgive me for not having a right attitude about gratitude. Help me, Heavenly Father, to walk in gratefulness and thanksgiving. Release into my life power provision, and protection. But I understand, Lord, that it starts with me having a right attitude about gratefulness. God, thank you so much. Father, I pray right now, Lord, that as we get ready to walk out of this building, I pray, Father, that your anointing would be upon every person. Lord, let the joy of the Lord be their strength. They get the the potential, the ability to rejoice always. Father, we thank you for it right now in Jesus' name. You're in this place, and you need to rededicate your life to the Lord. Or is there anybody here that needs to accept Jesus as their Lord and personal Savior? They want to get into a right space with God. Is there anybody here? I don't ever want to let a service go by where we don't get anybody an opportunity to meet Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Is there anyone? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, guess what? We like to leave with a shout. We're going to shout hallelujah, but I want to let you know, too, that we are a Pentecostal church. If you have an interest in learning more about the gift of tongues or being baptized in the Holy Spirit, I'll be down front, and I'll share some thoughts with you, give you a little bit of information. But I believe that 2024 is going to be a year where we see God do more in our lives. How many of you will agree with me on that? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to leave with a shout on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming. We'll see you on Wednesday. No, no, no Wednesday service. We'll see you Sunday. God bless you.